I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Professor Thomas Cooley. Tom is the uh, Paganelli uh, Bull Professor of Economics at the Stern School uh, of Business at uh, New York University. Uh, Tom is also, um, one of his early jobs was a UCSB economics professor um, early in his career. He comes back every once in a while. Um, he has um, written a couple books. One's called How to Repair a Failed System. Another one's called The New Architecture of Global Finance. I think what's most impressive about Tom, though, he um, has this great blog that he does. Uh, it's called um, Econ Snapshot and another one called European Snapshot. And uh, I do, I'm on it too. So you should go to Econ Snapshot. Anyway, I'd like to welcome uh, Tom Cooley. Well, thank you all very much for having me here. It's a delight always to be in Santa Barbara. I try to be here as often as I can. Uh, so I'm going to provide a little bit of contrast to Neil Borofsky, a rather dark picture of the financial system. I'm going to provide an even darker picture of the European economy. <laughs> so, um, okay, there we go. So the, the question I want to pose and then quickly answer is, is the European crisis over? In 2012, yields on 10-year debt of Italy, Spain, and other countries shot up to over 7%, which meant that they were on a very unsustainable path for their sovereign debt. We saw the first ever default of a rated Eurozone sovereign, Greece. Uh, investors were tremendously worried about what we call redenomination risk, which is the risk that countries will decide to exit and redenominate their debt in a new local currency. Uh, and ratings of Eurozone sovereigns plummeted almost in, your, in unison. And then at the beginning of 2013, things seemed to change around, turn around a bit. Yields on the 10-year debt of Italy, Spain, and other periphery countries plunged. And uh, some of them that had been locked out of bond markets, like Portugal, were able to go back into the markets and, and uh, raise, raise debt. So the market response seemed to follow the August 2012 announcement by the ECB, by Mario Draghi, that he would do whatever it takes to preserve the euro, and then the introduction of the possibility of outright monetary transactions, meaning direct ECB purchases of European sovereign bonds. Um, Cross-border payment flows seem to be stabilizing. Uh, so here's a picture of, of the, the period in question. And m my question is, what happened here? Why did these uh, yield spreads suddenly plunge? So these are spreads for Greece, Ireland, Italy, Portugal, Spain, the so-called uh, pigs or gypsies. I think that's a nicer name for them. Um, this is the same picture updated to March, and there's been some very slight reversal, but the story is basically the same. So what I'm going to talk about today, though my answer to the question I posed at the beginning is no, this crisis is not over. Um, indeed, it's a more complex crisis than most people appreciate. There are really four crises that we have to talk about. One is an economic crisis. Uh, the second is a sovereign crisis or a sovereign debt crisis. Third is a banking crisis. And lastly, a governance crisis. And there's mutually adverse feedback among these crises. So this is a picture of the path of real GDP for the major European economies. These are not the basket cases like Greece and Portugal and and Ireland and so on. These are the, these are the powerful economies, Italy, Spain, Germany, um, the Netherlands, and France, and the UK. And this, these pictures show the decline in real GDP from the peak of the previous business cycle, from the previous peak of output in these countries. And that happens to coincide with the previous peak in the US. 
And what you see from this picture is that with the single exception of Germany, which is the green line at the top, uh, these countries are all not recovered. Not only have they not recovered, they're sinking back into recession. So there's a full-blown new recession that's gripped the European economies, um, and it's causing a great deal of havoc. So just for contrast, here's the same picture with uh, the path of real GDP for the U.S. superimposed. And so as, as unhappy as may, we may be about our recovery in the U.S., we're doing a lot better than the Europeans are. We're still growing, albeit at a somewhat anemic rate uh, relative to our past expectations. So the only exception to this story is Germany, which fell much further in the contraction and began to recover much more quickly and has generally uh, survived the, the crisis uh, pretty well. But Germany, again, has turned down. So, um, so there's a real problem. So this is a picture of investment in these economies. Uh, again, they show the same story. Investment is contracting again or it has never recovered. This bodes ill for the long-term prospects of these economies. And again, the blue line uh, shows the behavior in the U.S. Slightly balky. Okay. The unemployment rate uh, in Europe is, uh, is something that's worth bemoaning because many of these countries are experiencing levels of unemployment that are greater than the U.S. experienced during the Great Depression, Spain in particular. Um, and there has been absolutely no recovery uh, over the course, uh, over the months and years since the, the financial crisis hit us in unemployment rates in these, in these countries. Uh, labor force participation rates are low. Uh, employment rates are, are low as well. Okay, so the economic crisis sets the bat drop for these other crises. There are big differences in the states of economic health of these countries. Germany is still pretty healthy. Several other, several small economies are incredibly weak. And the European Union or the Eurozone leadership has several simultaneous goals that they need to try to accomplish. One is to stabilize the banking system in the periphery and elsewhere, to get on a sustainable fiscal path and help countries get on sustainable fiscal paths, to promote economic recovery, and to correct flaws in the framework of the EMU. So one of the things I want to talk about are why, why, are we, why are they having these problems? What is it about the nature of the Euro, the Eurozone system that's, uh, that's exacerbating these problems? Okay. So one way I like to, I find it convenient to talk about that particular question is to look at this chart. I hope it's visible. So what this does is it contrasts two monetary unions. One is the United States, which is a monetary union. Notable about the United States is that it was a fiscal union before it was a monetary union. And the other is the EMU countries. And so what I've tried to highlight is what are, what are the common elements and what are the differences? Uh, do we have a common fiscal policy? In the US, we do. In Europe, they don't. Uh, do we have fiscal burden sharing? In the U.S., we do. In Europe, they don't. Labor market mobility is high in the U.S. and very low in Europe still. Um, you can contrast the, the unemployment rates and the ratio of the richest to the poorest uh, or the strongest to the weakest labor markets. Prices and wages, uh, flexible in the U.S., less flexible in Europe. And then uh, the ratio of the richest states to the poorest states and some measure of the degree of inequality across Europe. It's much greater in Europe than in the U.S. And then finally, a part that I think is very uh, 
important is, do they have a common deposit insurance, bank regulation, and uh, public backstop for the banking system? And as we know in the US, the answer to that is yes. In Europe, the answer to that is no. And that, I think, is one of the important elements of the crisis, of the difference. So <laughs> contrasting the two areas, the euro area has uh, the big differences between the euro area and the US are in labor mobility, fiscal burden sharing, and financial burden sharing. So maybe given these differences, a more interesting question than the one I posed in the first chart is the same chart, but the question is, what happened here? What happened in those years in which the spreads were essentially zero, in which the yields on the debt of Greece, Italy, Spain, and so on were, were the same as the yields on German bunds? So these are the spreads over German bunds. Um, and what is it about uh, the Euro experiment that led people to believe this was the right equilibrium? In many ways, that's a more puzzling question. This um, picture shows the path of general government gross debt as a percentage of GDP uh, for uh, Greece, Italy, Portugal, Ireland, France, Spain, and Germany. The black bars represent what that level was in 1999 and the orange what it was in 2012. And there are vast differences in fiscal performance. Everyone's fiscal performance deteriorated somewhat, some more starkly than others. Um, but the important thing I want to emphasize about this is that th there, there is a sovereign debt issue uh, when we look at Europe, but it's not just a sovereign debt issue. The, when we look at the European economies, there are many different stories that explain or that account for why they're in a crisis state. When they joined the euro, borrowing costs fell uh, for these countries. Uh, <coughs> central bank discipline resulted in a credibility of, of monetary policy and low inflation expectations. That helped all these economies. They all lowered their borrowing costs. Um, but there were problems. There were risk subsidies and risk myopia, inadequate supervision of fiscal authorities in these countries. Uh, for example, Portugal and Greece, they, they grew their government debt enormously um, to increase public spending. Ireland and Spain are a different story. They had housing bubbles. Uh, the housing bubbles led to a dramatic increase in household debt and private debt. Uh, much of that ended up on, in one way or the other, on the balance sheet of the central government in the form of government debt. Italy, a different story again. They had a legacy of very high deficits. They joined the Eurozone with a debt to GDP ratio of over 100%. Uh, and they actually ran fairly responsible fiscal policies through much of the, that era. So there's not just one story that explains these things, and it's not just uh, a sovereign debt crisis or a fiscal crisis. Um, so what I want to talk about next, then, is the banking crisis. And I've alluded to the fact that one of the characteristics, one of the distinctions between the US and Europe is that we have a common system of superreg, bank supervision, regulation, lender of last resort facilities, deposit, centralized deposit insurance, and resolution mechanisms for sol insolvent uh, uh, banks for and insolvent or illiquid banks, okay? So one of the things that we've tried to do at NYU, my colleagues and I, is measure the amount of risk in the banking system. Neil alluded to these books we produced on regulating financial markets, uh, regulating the banking system. And one of the things that we think it's important to measure is how much systemic risk there is in the banking system. And what I want to show you are some numbers that contrast 
risk in the US banking system with risk in the European banking system. So how do you measure that risk? Well, imagine that you had a tail event. That is a big shock to equity markets. And as a consequence, banks needed to raise more capital. Um, <laughs> the value of their equity, their ec equity capital relative to assets shrinks. They have to raise capital. Uh, how much depends on their leverage ratios. And uh, it matters if it's a common shock that affects all banks at the same time as it did uh, 2007, 2009. Uh, and the problem is that if lots of banks are trying to raise additional capital at the same time, that's after following a, a huge shock, that's what we call a financial crisis. We have another financial crisis. So if this measure of this risk, we measure the, the risk that's implied by this. And if it's big, then financial firms are going to begin building balance sheets now by raising loan standards, selling assets, uh, and that can contribute to the economic slowdown. In a crisis, it's hard to raise capital, so um, there is a little bit of a get in line first uh, mood in the financial markets with respect to bank capital, and a lot of dispute about how big bank capital should be, and I'm hoping we'll be, have a discussion about that uh, later on. Um, so here, I'm going to show you some measures of how big this systemic risk is. So this is systemic risk in the banking system. This is a measure quoted in billions of US dollars, uh, and this is by country. So Japan is the biggest. Uh, United States is next, but then next you have France, UK, China, Germany, Canada, Italy, Spain. What does it look like in the US? So this is a measure of systemic risk uh, over some period of time in the US banking system. Um, this is just over a couple of years, and what you see is it's it's a little lower now than it, than it was, but it's not low. It's, it's going up again, and it hasn't really declined markedly since uh, the end of 2010. Where is it in the, where is this risk located in the US system? This is just for your interest. Uh, this is by financial institution. So at the top, uh, Bank of America, Next, J.P. Morgan Chase. I don't think these numbers should be surprising to anyone, given if you read the newspapers. Um, Citigroup, MetLife, Prudential, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs. So the, the, big, the big hitters are all there, topping the list of uh, systemic risk in the financial system. But I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm more interested in talking about Europe, this is measure of systemic risk by country normalized by the size of their GDP. So when you normalize by GDP, uh, not surprisingly, Cyprus jumps to the head of the pack, um, and Greece is way up there, but also the UK, France, Switzerland, they're all up there. So this is a measure of systemic risk in Europe. Uh, given the back and forth, you can't remember, but this is roughly four times what it was in what the systemic risk in uh, the US is, okay? So uh, the main point here is to emphasize that the European banking system is incredibly risky. It's riskier than the US banking system. They have very thin, brittle capital uh, ratios in European banks. Most of it, okay, this rates them by, by country now. Most of it is in France. France is the riskiest. Uh, the UK is second. Germany, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, the Netherlands, uh, and so on. And then, once again, normalized by GDP, slightly different, but those countries are really big. So uh, you all read this week about Deutsche Bank going back to the market to uh, recapitalize itself a bit, and markets actually responded very favorably to the fact that uh, they were adding to their capital buffers. 
it's just widely recognized that the capital levels in European banks are insufficient. And that adds to the crisis. So lastly, we can talk about governance crisis. And how do we get here? How do we get to this point of being, uh, of having such problems with this, what seemed initially like such a great idea? Well, when the euro was designed, it was designed well in terms of monetary policy because the de monetary policy design had built-in credibility. It had built-in credibility because individual sovereigns gave up the right to create their own money. So when they adopted the euro, they ceded monetary policy to the European Central Bank, which was uh, designed to deliver monetary policy that looked like Bundesbank monetary policy. But the fiscal and prudential policy designs were not time consistent. They set targets for uh, deficits and debt to GDP ratios, but they were almost never honored. And there was no, there was no uh, sense in which they, they had to be. And they also had what were mutually inconsistent goals. Among these, were you, they wanted to have free cross-border banking and capital flows and financial stability. Uh, and they wanted to preserve a great deal of sovereignty on the part of the member states. So they wanted it to be the case that a euro in a bank in Spain is the same as a euro in a bank in Germany. Guess what? It's not. Uh, it's not in the current, uh, in the current context. Uh, in 19th century terms, uh, deposits trade at par across the region. So, uh, and it, they made a lot of policy mistakes uh, and they had inadequate market discipline. So some of the key policy mistakes actually undermined market discipline. Uh, there was a resistance of sovereign default as an enforcement mechanism, which they should have encouraged more of early on. There was a lack of credibility of no bailout clauses that were enshrined in the uh, European Constitution. Uh, they assigned zero risk weights to sovereign debts, so banks could hold sovereign debts on their balance sheet uh, with a zero risk weight. And, uh, the EC and they could use sovereign debt in the ECB's repo market with a, a zero risk, risk weight. So major policy mistakes, inadequate banking regulation. There's no common banking regulation. There's no common resolution authority or resolution mechanism for European banks. And that's going to be very difficult to achieve. Imagine trying to reconcile whatever it is, 17 to 20 different bankruptcy codes uh, across Europe. And there's been a lack of structural form, reform of the economies. Improvements in labor markets uh, and labor market policies have only appeared in Germany, which was very serious about reforming its labor market. And it, as a consequence, benef benefited greatly from those reforms in the teeth of the Great Recession. And there's been a piecemeal crisis response. So the, the response has been one of trying to beat back the idea, beat back the, the notion of redenomination risk. So you can look at a lot of the ECB's actions of stepping in, uh, help, trying to help recapitalize individual banks, uh, authorizing outright monetary transactions, is trying to take off the table the option for a country to redenominate its debt and currency. Um, and so the, you know, the consequence of ECB's policies has been to buy time. We've seen a reversal in, uh, in the outright pessimism in markets, but the economy is doing very poorly. Um, the banking system very badly needs recapitalization, and it remains to be seen how uh, how this is going to be resolved. So burden sharing requires sacrifice of sovereignty to eliminate to limit moral hazard. 
once, we, once they recognize that they have some obligation for fiscal burden sharing, and that's the way the U.S. got started on a path of fiscal credibility, was when the central government assumed the debts of the state following the Revolutionary War, um, we established the credibility of the central fiscal authority, and that gave us the ability to borrow uh, in worldwide markets. Um, <coughs> there's a lot of sort of crisis-driven mechanisms that have been put in place to uh, deliver burden sharing uh, and mutual surveillance of countries' fiscal policy. To the extent that they're credible, they may help, uh, but it's not completely clear that they are. So there's a very dangerous dynamics in going on in Europe. Uh, governments respond to market discipline, but the actions of the European Central Bank uh, diminish di discipline. So the promise that, of, of the European Central Bank that it will do whatever it takes to preserve the euro and he will engage in outright monetary transactions undermines the market discipline on individual countries. In addition to which, there, this is a crisis of governance at the Eurozone level, uh, but what's been all too apparent is that there are many crises of governance at sovereign levels. So look at Italy's recent election, look at the election results in Greece, uh, the chaos in Spain and uh, uh, relative chaos in France. Okay, so what are the options? Well, uh, could these countries willingly abandon the euro? That's highly unlikely. That's not an economic decision. That's a political one. Uh, but it would threaten the entire EU. So... <laughs> Then there's the question of what would happen during the transition. Well, you'd have the mother of all uh, crises, bank runs, capital flight, sovereign default. So re-denomination is not a very attractive option for any individual country, and it's certainly not an attractive option for the euro as a whole, eurozone as a whole. Would Europe then turn to floating exchange rates or return to a system of fixed exchange rates like the uh, exchange rate mechanism of the 1990s? Uh, I don't know. What are the options? Well, they could enact a, a fiscal compact that, that somehow achieves credible fiscal rules in a new treaty uh, and in state constitutions. They could require debt pay down over time. Uh, they could require debt priority, uh, meaning that holders of general obligations, sovereign bonds, would be first in line to be repaid by individual countries. That's how we man manage uh, fiscal credibility in the U.S. states. Holders of general obligation, California bonds, have, uh, have priority. Um, we could have structural reforms that boost growth in countries like Italy and Spain. But so far, what we've seen has not been terribly successful. Or we could end up with a smaller, less divergent EMU. We could have a northern EMU consisting of Finland, uh, Germany, and the, the, uh, uh, the Netherlands, and strong economies, and, and a southern EMU that consists of economies that are more like one another. Or lastly, we could inflate away the debt. So there's a basic theorem of fiscal policy that, uh, that every household trying to uh, do a budget knows that in the end, you have three choices. Uh, and one is you can default on your debt. The second is you can grow faster. So grow enough income to diminish the burden of the debt over time. None of these countries are growing fast. They're all shrinking. Uh, the third is that you can default on the obligations that are implied by 
your debt. So you can default on pensions, on government employment, on all the things that governments uh, do for its citizenry. And the third, and this is now not open, an option that's open to individual members of the Eurozone, is you can deflate away the debt. You can create inflation, lower the real burden of the debt. Um, there are many people who argue that prudent policy would be for the ECB to adopt a much higher inflation target to sort of ease the burden of the debt uh, on, on the periphery countries. But I want to argue that the real problems are design problems. They're problems of design of the banking system, design of the fiscal policy, and that there's no monetary solution that can take care of these. So my projection is that the European financial crisis is not only not over, it's going to continue to provide headwinds for the U.S. economy because, of course, that's our, our, our a major trading partner, and what g happens in Europe affects what happens in the U.S. So I think that, that we should be worried about their economies, we should be worried about their banking system, and we have to be worried about the long-run stability of the arrangements they've structured. With that, I'll stop. Thank you. Our next speaker, uh, Douglas Elliott uh, from Brookings Institute. Um, Doug has spent uh, two decades at J.P. Morgan before moving over to Brookings. He also um, uh, started the Center on um, Federal Financial Institutions. And um, please welcome Doug Elliott. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's uh, always a pleasure to be out here. Th this morning, I had the chance to uh, walk down State Street down to Stearns Wharf, and you all live in a really beautiful place. I hope you haven't gotten uh, too jaded by being here all the time. Uh, let me explain a little bit about uh, Brookings and about who I am, because I think any time that you're dealing with people from Washington or the political world, it's important, considering how polarized everything is today, that, that you have an idea of what their orientation is what team they're on. Uh, and so let me start with Brookings. Uh, you may have heard of it. It's essentially the world's leading think tank. Uh, think tank is like a, it's a nonprofit. It's a little bit like a university research department, but with the idea that we focus on trying to provide good policy advice to the government and to the public to consider uh, as they're thinking about uh, about voting or influencing the government. Uh, I'm very lucky to be there. I have a, a range of great colleagues. Two of my colleagues uh, have been vice chairs of the Federal Reserve. Uh, one of them was uh, chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors under Clinton, and there are a whole range of really good people. I, I sort of snuck in there. I'm unusual in that I have a non-academic background. Uh, and uh, as you heard, I was an investment banker for about 20 years after I did some narco-terrorism for a while. Um, personally, I'm unusual for Washington in that I, I don't have a political orientation. Uh, I'm not affiliated with either party, and uh, I uh, am by nature a moderate in my opinions, which, again, puts me uh, relatively unusual. What I, what I try to do is to just kind of present things down the middle. Uh, as Brookings in general does, we try to focus on working from the facts and the analysis forward rather than starting with a set ideology. Uh, so anyway, that kind of gives you some idea. Uh, as I was thinking about how I might be useful to you, it seemed to me that there are three broad themes that would be helpful to emphasize. I'll just run through them very quickly and then go into them in more detail. The first is, if you've been thinking that the very strong role that governments have been playing uh, since the financial crisis here and elsewhere is a fluke that will pass when the crisis passes, uh, I think you should think again. Uh, in fact, you're likely to see very strong government involvement in the economy, 
and in individual, not necessarily individual business decisions, but in decisions which affect how businesses operate, both here and overseas. I'll come back to that a little bit. Second, if I have time, I want to talk a bit about uh, the same theme that the immediate preceding speaker was. Uh, I guess one reason I was chosen to come here is that I'm a relative optimist. I actually think that Europe is quite likely to muddle through. There are risks, and those risks could be very bad if they go wrong. But I'm a relative optimist on Europe. I'd like to talk about that, again, if I haven't run out of time at the end of this. Oh, there's the clock, all right. Uh, and the bulk of what I'm going to talk about today is about financial reform. And there, my overall take is that I do think Dodd-Frank and Basel III and the other reforms that are being done here and globally will and are making the financial system considerably safer than it was. But there will be transition problems, and there are some implement and implementation risks which could make me be wrong, though obviously I don't think it's going to work out that way. So starting with my first point, uh, we've gone through, prior to the crisis, 25 very good years here and uh, in much of the world. And as the economy did so well, what you saw was that governments became increasingly laissez-faire. Increasingly, they tried to let the economy operate with lighter touch regulation and with less in the way of monetary actions, et cetera. Uh, but this is a really unusual period. It got so good that economists ended up coining a phrase. They called it the great moderation. That is, instead of business cycles that consistently every few years you went up and then you went down, and it could be pretty ugly when you went down, we actually had not a bad time at all for that period. And it seemed like we had figured out, the policymakers had figured out, how to make the economy run pretty smoothly. And we saw much of the rest of the world, uh, places like China, growing very rapidly as they started to catch up towards uh, established Western economies. If you look farther back, though, for hundreds of years, if not thousands, what you find is that government decisions have immensely affected how businesses do and how investments of all kinds do. And I think what you're going to find post-crisis is that while the frenetic level of activity of the first couple of years of the crisis will calm down, you're going to see, I think, here and overseas, governments which do intervene more than they had the preceding couple decades prior to the crisis. So let me just throw that out for you to keep in the back of your mind. I'll come back to Europe. I have time. So let me focus on financial reform. Now, what you think about financial reform, what you think should have been done, and how you measure what we've actually done versus that, depends very heavily on what narrative you believe about what made the financial crisis happen. And with uh, Neil Borowski's talk earlier, you heard a fairly strong form of one of what I would call the three main narratives. So let me start with that one. The first narrative, and this I would say generally is the belief of most liberals, most of the media, and probably frankly most of the public, is that Wall Street did it. That it was greed, incompetence, uh, too big to fail, subsidies, etc., and that Wall Street took on way too much risk. It led the rest of the country and the financial system into taking excessive risks. It created these very, very complicated products that only really made sense as a way for them to make money in the short run. That the rating agencies got sucked into it as well. The regulators were uh, either were captured intellectually or they actually were too close in other ways. Uh, et cetera. I think, again, this is where the, how the media usually reports it, so I'm sure you're very familiar with, with this. Uh, a second narrative that is less prominent in the media, but that many conservatives, particularly in Washington, hold strongly, is that 
you know, sure, a lot of that stuff happened, but what this really was is the mother of all housing bubbles. And that this happened because of d bad government policy. That we did everything we could to push people who couldn't afford housing into owning their own homes rather than renting. And tried to grease the wheels of the financial system so everybody was pushing in that same direction. Um, and that if we hadn't had that massive a bubble, the system could have handled it. You have ups and downs in the markets, we'd have had one of the downs, maybe a bad one, but nothing like what actually happened. There's a third narrative, which comes closer to what I would uh, subscribe to, which is uh, everyone did it. It was Wall Street, it was the government, it was even us often as individuals taking excessive risk in housing, excessive risk in the stock market, that this was a very widespread set of underlying problems. Monetary policy through the government was too loose and helped to fuel speculation. Uh, essentially that the first two narratives are both right and you can extend this even further to who shares in the blame for it. Now that broad an indictment really requires stepping back and saying well what would make so many people act so stupidly? Uh, and, I mean, we all know people. People can be really stupid sometimes. But this is huge and over a quite extended period. Uh, uh, Martin Bailey and I, Martin's a colleague of mine that I mentioned, formerly was chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. He and I wrote a paper a few years ago on the causes of the financial crisis that walked through these narratives and explained why we think the third narrative is most accurate of these oversimplifications. Uh, and why it might have worked out that way. And the biggest thing we point to as a true underlying factor is simply markets are prone to overconfidence and then dramatic underconfidence as the bubble bursts. And that in this case, we had 25 really good years. I mean, a lot of you are too young to have really focused on this, but think back in 1982, the Dow bottomed out at 800. It went up by over 16 times in the, in the following 25 years. We all know that while there were swings, housing prices went up very considerably. The truth is almost anything you could take a risk on in that period paid off if you held on long enough. And so people learned the lesson just through experience that first, the textbooks tell you that you have to take more risk if you want more reward, but that in real life, it felt like the risk wasn't even really risk. You just had to be patient and hold on. And if, again, thinking about the stock market, we did have some falls in that period, significant ones. I was at a trading desk in 1987 while we had the crash in the stock market then. One day, the market fell more than 20%. But you know, it recovered quite quickly after that. So you either had relatively shallow dips that might have been a little bit longer, or you had a sharp drop, but it recovered fast. So people got in the habit of not paying enough attention to risk. They either didn't see the risk at all, or they saw it, but it didn't scare them the way it should have. So this was true of, certainly true of Wall Street but it was also true of investors we don't normally think of as, as Wall Street. It was true of governments, both here and abroad. It was true in regard to stocks, bonds, uh, housing. It was true, part of the cause of the Euro crisis was that for years, people treated the government of Greece almost like the government of Germany because the feeling was they were all part of the Euro and the strong countries wouldn't let the weak countries go under. So, there, so you got paid almost nothing extra for uh, owning Greek debt, but people still bought it. So you had people taking these kind of risks. Regulators and rating agencies were more scared and more conservative than the markets, but they weren't nearly careful enough. Everybody basically got sucked in. Uh, so when you look at it that way, I think there are two broad lessons. 
One is, you want to fix the specific things that we saw went wrong. So uh, one of the arguments I have, this guy named Peter Wallace at the American Enterprise Institute, that he and I are good friends and we're often on the opposite sides of debates about financial reform. He's of the school that it's really, there was really this giant housing bubble that the government created through Fannie and Freddie and various other things. And as I said, I think there's, there's some truth to that. That was certainly a significant part of it. But one of my arguments to him is, even if that was the cause, there were a whole series of knock-on problems. There were things we discovered that went wrong. We looked at what Wall Street did with these crazy products. We looked at how mortgages were being pushed on people. These were things that needed to be fixed, regardless of whether they were directly the cause, as I think they partly were, of the financial crisis. Uh, an analogy I sometimes use is the San Francisco earthquake of, you guys probably know, it's like 1907, was it? Something like that, early 1900s. Uh, most of the damage in the San Francisco earthquake came from fires afterwards, and so they very sensibly changed the housing codes to discourage building houses out of stuff that burns. Uh, I don't think we should look at the crisis we just went through and said, well, maybe it was caused by this particular thing, so we're not going to fix all the stuff we noticed afterwards. We needed something very comprehensive. And secondly, related to that, in addition to trying to do things to keep this from happening again, we also need more safety margins in the system so that if we don't guess the cause of the next crisis and therefore don't work to prevent it adequately, that we have more protection so when things blow up, we're in a better position to deal with it. Uh, again, it's something like the housing codes in San Francisco after the quake. Again, as I said, I'm pro I really appear to be the relative optimist here. So let me just say, I think that the Dodd-Frank Act in the U.S., the major of uh, legislation on financial reform, and the so-called Basel III Accord, which is the global agreement on how to make the banks hold more capital to protect themselves, more liquidity, that these are the basic safety margins that banks have to protect against things going wrong. Uh, I think these set of measures and a number of other things that are being done around the world do help considerably. In my own view, it probably gets us two-thirds of the way from where we were to where we ought to be. And here maybe I'm not such an optimist, I'm perhaps a, a pragmatist or even a cynic, but I think it's impossible to ever get in public policy all the way to where you should be. You just can't do it. The fact is, with something as complex and important as this, getting two-thirds of the way is a cause, into my mind, for some celebration. Now, that doesn't mean we should stop. We should try to figure out what still needs to change, try to improve those aspects of it. But I hear too many people in academics, the media, and in politics who speak as if we've accomplished nothing because we have not accomplished everything. And I think that's a misjudgment of where we actually are. Now, one of the things I like about Dodd-Frank and Basel III, I think is probably one of the things that Neil Borowski does not like, which I think is it's a fairly balanced approach to dealing with the risks. It's saying that for all the problems we just had, there are core elements of our economy and of our financial system that actually are as we'd want them to be. We need to do significant fixes. I, I, I liken it a little bit to uh, when Franklin Roosevelt faced the Great Depression, things were incredibly bad here as they were in much of the rest of the world. You could see why people were saying, get rid of our capitalist democratic system, go to fascism or go to communism, or Huey Long had his whatever he called it down in Louisiana he was proposing. There were various attractive ideas for really radical change. Instead, what FDR did was he took very strong actions. But what he said was, market capitalism in a democratic system has such overwhelming advantages, we don't want to throw them away 
because we now see that that needs significant fixing. And that's kind of my view of the financial system. There were really serious problems, and some of them remain. But the core of the system is something that we've seen over time works. And you want to be very careful about just throwing it out and making really huge changes. And this ties into another point I'd like to make, which is in general, regulation is a balancing act. You have to do a cost-benefit analysis constantly, sometimes a formal economic type of cost-benefit analysis, sometimes just simply thinking about, is the burden I'm imposing really worth it for the extra safety I'm getting? And uh, I, I focus on this as part of my own work. I did about a year-long study for the International Monetary Fund analyzing the likely effects on the supply of credit and the price of credit from the major global financial reforms that are being put in place. And I concluded, as I think any reasonable person would, there is a cost. You can't add these safety margins without making credit less available and, in particular, more expensive. Then the question really becomes, well, how much more expensive is it, and how much additional safety am I really getting, and what's that worth? Now, I concluded in the study for the IMF, of, again, I'm an optimist, I concluded that the main things we're doing really are worthwhile, but there's a cost. What I concluded for the U.S. is going from where we were a couple, sorry, let me, let me step back. One of the interesting things about cost-benefit analyses is you have to figure out what your base is you're comparing against. And I think we need to recognize that much of what's happened in the financial system after the crisis would have happened even if regulators had just stayed home, even if Congress hadn't passed any bills. Uh, markets are not stupid. Lots of people lost a lot of money in the crisis, and they stepped back and said, okay, that was stupid. That was bad. We shouldn't have done it that way. What is it we want to see going forward? And investors are much more careful on many things these days. A number of the products that have disappeared disappeared not because of new regulation, but because investors are no longer stupid enough to buy them. So I, in, from my analysis, I think maybe two-thirds of the changes in terms of the safety margins of capital and liquidity would have been required by the markets anyway. But that additional third, which is what I focused on, uh, I think will probably mean credit costs about a quarter of a percentage point on average more in the U.S. than it would have otherwise. Well, to me, having loans be a quarter of a percent more expensive is a pretty small price to pay for significantly reducing the chance of going through the kind of hell we just did. There are real long-term effects of having that severe a recession. Not only do we get the initial hit, but then we start from this lower base, and it takes a long time to catch back up. Uh, this type of cost-benefit analysis approach is one reason why I've been particularly disturbed to see some of the academics and many non-academics who have taken up this idea that you can require banks to have much more capital and there's no economic cost. Uh, it's a complicated topic, but the basic idea is there are people like uh, Anad Admati or Simon Johnson or others, uh, even uh, Krugman, the Nobel Prize winner, who argue that you want banks to have significantly more funding from their shareholders and less funding from debt and depositors. And by the way, directionally, I agree with that too. The argument they make, though, is that this is essentially free, and it's not. And I've written about this. I'm happy to talk at greater length about it. But I think it's dangerous because it can push us towards a financial system. The Brown-Vitter bill would do this that was mentioned earlier. It would make for much higher capital requirements. We could have a system in which banks are much less willing to lend and where they charge significantly more for it. And this is not what our economy probably ever needs, and it certainly doesn't need it right now. So I worry about that. Uh, while I'm talking about risks, uh, let me name a few of the risks that uh, concern me about the financial reforms. Again, 
within the context that overall I think we're doing the right things. Uh, one is I do worry, worry that we're putting in too many belts and suspenders. It's a natural response. The world blew up. You want to figure out how to keep that from happening again. But part of what happens is each regulatory body, and we have too many of them in the US, uh, each of them figures its job is to solve the whole problem. And so you get layers and layers of new regulation and safety measures put in. And it makes it hard to get that balance right. And I, I give the regulators a lot of credit. They are aware of this risk. They do try to work against it, but it's just kind of hard. If you're a regulator, you want to regulate. And if you don't regulate, you're afraid that somebody will come in from the outside and say, you've been bought off by the banks. That's why you're not doing this additional thing. Uh, so that's one risk. A related risk, which is more a political risk than a regulatory risk, because the regulators are not behind this one, is there's been an excessive uh, focus on this whole too big to fail thing. I absolutely agree that too big to fail matters. No sane analyst could think otherwise. But I think if you look at the last crisis, which is what we're mostly reacting to, it was at most 10% of the problem. Now, if that sounds wrong to you, do a simple thought experiment. Let's say that well prior to the crisis, we'd broken up my old firm of J.P. Morgan into 20 pieces and Bank of America into 17 pieces, and we'd broke them all down. Uh, what would really have been all that different? You would have had way too much investment in real estate-related products, both retail mortgages and also commercial mortgages. You would have had people taking crazy risks. You would have had incentive structures that made people want to, to uh, uh, try for a home run. Uh, you would have had rating agencies that acted exactly like they did in reality. You would have had the government pushing housing. You have all the things that were the core causes would have been the same. So it's, and the res resolution of the problem might have been even harder. For all of the many flaws with how we handled the financial crisis, it actually was helpful to be able to get 17 people in a room and tell them, here's the TARP, this is emergency action we're taking, and you guys are going to participate. Uh, there actually was not a legal ability to make that happen. This was browbeating them as much as anything. Well, you bring 200 people into the room and try the same thing, you're going to get some people who don't agree. Uh, I'm not saying we're better off because of this. I'm just saying that it, it actually, there were some modest advantages to having uh, that more concentrated system. And the disadvantages are, are way less important than I think people describe them as. Uh, I also, ha and here I could just be because of, I basically grew up at J.P. Morgan and I saw a lot of things that worked well. But I actually do believe our country needs at least a small number of very large financial institutions that are global in scope, provide a very wide range of services to at least our biggest companies, and increasingly our medium-sized ones that also export, very wide range of products, and do each of those products at a scale that allows them to do it cheaply. Now, we also need smaller banks and medium-sized banks. We need specialized banks. I'm just saying, as part of the package, I think we actually need at least a few large banks. And given how big the world is and how big our economy is, they're going to be at some level too big to fail. Now, there are things you can do to try to counteract that, and th those are in Dodd-Frank. But I personally believe we're going to be stuck with this to some extent, no matter what else we do. Uh, so I worry about things like the Brown-Vitter bill and other proposals that would eliminate our largest banks by forcing them to break up into much, much smaller pieces. Uh, I also think the regulators and politicians have been placing too little focus on the importance of the financial markets. That is, it, it's a funny thing. They're more focused on the banks as being the bad guys rather than other market participants. And yet many of the things that are being done are going to make it harder for those markets to operate partly because the big financial institutions, the banks and the others, are significant players in these markets. 
And so trying to just force them out without a sensible way of doing it uh, creates problems. I, I mentioned I've been a strong supporter of Dodd-Frank, but I hate the Volcker rule. I actually think it's completely misguided and I can vet at great length if you want at some point. Um, similarly, I think that risk management products, many of which are derivatives, have a real use in a, our economy and I think they're being seen as, uh, well, derivatives are seen as a four-letter word. And so you're, there's some of the things that are being done go too far in trying to limit them. So I have worries about that. I also worry about global coordination problems. Uh, we have a global financial system. Unless the world goes back to individual nations that don't pay much attention to one another, which I'm not going to bet on, uh, we're going to keep having a global financial system, probably a more and more globalized one. So the coordination has to be there. Here the glass is either half full or half, half empty. Even as an optimist, I'm not sure I can say it's half full, but it's in that range. Uh, there is a fair amount of global cooperation and financial reform, but we could use more. And, we're, and the last year or so, it's been deteriorating rather than getting better. So I do have some worries on that. But overall, I believe for all of the flaws of any major human endeavor, global financial reform is moving us forward. Parts of it are being implemented. As more and more gets implemented, I do think we'll be safer. Now, we will always have financial crises. Until we have computers running everything, you're going to have humans making decisions. Humans operate partly on emotion and biases of various kinds. And sometimes they come together to create excessive optimism. And sometimes it goes the opposite direction. And it can go quite suddenly from excessive optimism to excessive pessimism. So I don't think we'll eliminate crises. But what we can do is make them significantly less frequent and significantly less damaging when they occur. And I do think we're on the way to that. So I'll take two minutes on the euro crisis just to tell you where I'm coming from on that. I think much of the discussion in the US doesn't give enough weight to the very strong political will in Europe to pull through on this. It's easy to look at Germany, for example, and, and notice how much they complain about having to do things to help the weaker countries, but they're actually doing it. And the German election in September is likely to bring in a government that will be even more willing to do this, despite uh, German politics is peculiar, so this would be a big digression. I can uh, respond in Q&A if there's time if you want. But just take my word for it for the moment. Despite the grumbling in Germany, they will keep doing what they need to do. And I think other countries will largely do, do what they need to. Now that said, I think there's as much as a 20% chance of disaster. I just think there's about a four in five chance Europe muddles through. It'll be ugly. It will look as bad as our political system does, uh, and it will take them years, and they're going to have slow growth for a time. I'm not trying to be a, a Pollyanna here, but I don't think they're going to implode. And as long as they don't implode, the damage to the U.S. probably won't get any worse than we've already had from Europe. So uh, that's my relatively optimistic view on that. Thank you all. <laughs>